Hi, everyone. Okay, so I'm continuing with this book, Mass Control, Engineering Human Consciousness by Jim Keith. Gonna get through it. There's 29 chapters. <laughs> so um, I was gonna share <clears throat> an update on current events, but I feel like you guys are probably all paying attention, so I don't really need to do that. And this is very fascinating and interesting to me, so I'm gonna go ahead and speak to it. Chapter 13, Occult Connections. It is difficult to overestimate the role of religion and occultism in the history of world control. This is one means by which zealots are molded, who are unable to evaluate effectively, and who thus can be turned to the purposes of their controllers. In many religious or occult groups, the zombieism of the mind controlled is the entry fee. And the disposal program, sorry, ooh, Freudian slip. And the disposal problem of getting rid of the victims of mind control is not so formidable since cult members have often become disaffected with their former friends and family. So basically what they're saying is <clears throat> it's easy to get rid of them when we're done with them, right? So crazy. A quick scan through cultic history in recent years reveals significant branching connections, a few of which I will cover in this book. A prime instance of CIA involvement in a cult in recent years is the case of Jim Jones' People's Temple. Although nary a word of these dark underpinnings has slipped into mainstream accounts of the group. It's true. Evangelist Jim Jones started out as a member of Bertrand Russell's Fellowship of Reconciliation, which sponsored him at Butler College in Indianapolis. Oh, wow. That's interesting. I think we talked about Bertrand Russell earlier in earlier chapters. The fellowship is reported to have financed his first trip to Brazil in 1961. Jim Jones at the time told the Brazilians that he was in the employ of naval intelligence and both his food and lodging during his stay were provided by the U.S. Embassy. While in Brazil, Jones took regular trips to Belo Horizonte, the location of CIA headquarters in the region, and returned to the United States with an unexplained $10,000 cash windfall in 1961. Apparently, Jones was doing more than missionary work. According to one account, Jones has, had been part of a CIA effort attempting a government overthrow in South America and distributed leaflets and stirred up revolutionary sentiments during his stay. It is alleged that one of Jones' earliest source of financing for his work was Rabbi Maurice Davis, who provided him a church in Indianapolis. David was on the board of the American Family Foundation, the founding group for the Cult Awareness Network, and worked as a chaplain at the National Institute for Mental Health, infamous, the infamous Lexington Addiction Research Center, LARC where MK Ultra research had been done. So I'm going to read that again so that makes sense. So it is alleged that one of Jones' earliest sources of financing for his work was Rabbi Maurice Davis, who provided him a church in Indianapolis. David was on the board of the American Family Foundation, the founding group for the Cult Awareness Network, and worked as a chaplain at the National Institute for Mental Health's infamous Lexington, Lexington Addiction Research Center, where MKUltra research had been done. Jones moved his growing fellowship to Ukiah, California, 
where reports from the disaffected from his group said that behavior modification experiments were performed on the congregation. According to People's Temple, researcher Michael Myers, quote, Early temple experiments in sensory deprivation are not well documented, but it is known that Jones imparted his expertise to Donald DeFries, who utilized this technique to brainwash Patricia Hurst. Also, according to Myers, Tom Grubbs, a psychologist with the University of California, was in charge of the box. Grubbs, who was also principal of the Jonestown School, personally constructed Jones' sensory deprivation chamber. In Ukiah, Jones became chairman of the co country, sorry. In Ukiah, Jones became chairman of the county grand jury and worked with many wealthy collaborators, including persons connected to military and intelligence agencies. The Jones Group also infiltrated and took over the Mendocino County State Hospital, Mendocino State Hospital. As part of a government pilot project to evaluate the feasibility of D. Sorry, it's misspelled. It's deinstitutionalizing mental patients. After a reduction in state funding for psychiatric institutions, most of the patients at Mendocino were released into the custody of the People's Temple. Wow, that's super fascinating. So he just took a bunch of mental patients into his church, into the custody of the People's Temple. Really? He took a bunch of... Wow, that's interesting. In 1971, the People's Temple relocated to San Francisco, where Jones and many of his followers are said to have smoothly integrated as part of the Jerry Brown political machine. Ooh, Jerry Brown, yeah, holy, I remember him. Jones became the head of the San Francisco Housing Commission and used the City Welfare Department to recruit members for the People's Temple. Among the most important of Jones supporters were the Layton family, whose head, Dr. Lawrence Laird Layton, had relocated to America from Germany after World War II. Hmm. Project Paperclip, anyone? Layton had worked on the Manhattan Project and was chief of chemical and ecological warfare research at the Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah, where Army LSD research was carried out. Layton's wife, Eva, had worked for the CIA at Berkeley University. According to Dr. Colin Ross, her job at the library was to keep track of all the left-wing literature taken out of the library and the names of the people who took those books out and report that to the CIA. Another home for Jones's flock was set up in Guyana at the former site of the Shalom Project, allegedly a CIA training camp for guerrillas to be used in operations in Angola between 1973 and 1975. Jones received assistance from the U.S. Embassy in Georgetown, Guyana, which was also the headquarters for the CIA in the area. It has been alleged that all of the members of the embassy in Georgetown were agents of the CIA. At Jonestown, children were kept in line with electrical cattle prods. When Congressman Leo Ryan attempted to investigate Jonestown, members of the U.S. Embassy attempted to prevent him. This was finally left up to Jones's followers. The Jonestown deaths were the ultimate in assisted suicides. According to the officiating pathologist in Guyana, 80 to 90% of the victims had fresh needle marks on their bodies. Other victims had been shot or strangled. Others were sent to the U.S. military officials by an aide to National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski 
to remove all politically sensitive papers and forms of identification from the bodies. Jim Jones may have survived the destruction of the People's Temple compound. The body identified as being Jim Jones was so decomposed as to be unidentifiable, although it is reported that the corpse did not have Jones's distinctive chest tattoos. Examining the evidence, the conclusion is simple, inevitable. Jonestown was a project of U.S. intelligence agencies and the psychiatric establishment. And the mass murders or suicides there probably took place to cover that fact up. American media is in collusion in keeping the information from the public. The Esalen Institute located at Big Sur is a new age style group with a myriad of interesting connections. One of the founders of the group was Aldous Huxley, the primary advocate for the LSD dosing of the world. The first seminar on human potential at Esalen was led by Willis Harmon of Stanford Research Institute, who was anything but a hippie. Charles Manson and members of his group played a concert at Esalen three days before the Helter Skelter murders. Physicist Jack Sarfati, Sarfati reports on weird stories that he heard at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur that the occultist philosophy Erica had been founded, Arica, A R I C A had been founded in Chile by fugitive Nazis who were occult adepts. Sarfati says, many of the regulars at Esalen, including some of our group, like Dr. John Lilly and Claudio Naranjo, had been in the first Arica training in Chile. Sarfati also lists Soviet officials who were at Esalen in the late 70s and early 80s. Valentin M. Berez Berezkov, Yuri A. Zamoshkin, Andre A. Kokoshin, Henrikas Jeskovetsis, Vladimir M. Kuznetsov, Kuznetsov, and Victor M. Pogostin, Vlad Paul Kuznetsov, sorry. I'm butchering these names. Joseph Golden. This list is not complete. One of the people said to have been involved in the Russia, the Russian presence at Esalen is the Rockefeller-funded John Mack, formerly on the board of advisors of Warner's Earhart's establishment. Mack has lately achieved prominence as a UFO abduction researcher. Donna Bassett, who infiltrated Max Group, says that he had funded and he has been funded by an ex-CIA source. The Unification Church of Reverend Soon Myung Moon has since its beginnings maintained close connections to the South Korean Central Intelligence Agency. At least four of Moon's early acolytes were army officers closely connected to the founding director of the KCIA. One of Moon's most influential aides, Bo Hee Pak, liaised with the CIA for the KCIA and is said to have many, made many trips for the National Security Agency at Fort Meade, Maryland. Moon's church is enormously rich and influential, with at least 600 front groups by last count. Wow. The Unification Church. Among the group's notable acquisitions has been the Washington Times newspaper. That's fascinating. Which Moon, but this was 20 years ago, so that's probably different now. Which Moon admits had cost, has cost him more than a billion dollars. And the University of Bridgeport in Connecticut that is hired as a trustee, Jackie Thomas, former assistant chief of staff for the U.S. Air Force Intelligence. So as you can see, there's like 
all of this occult activity that ties in with the military industrial complex, right? That ties in with the CIA, that ties in with all the inner workings of our establishments, of our foundations of our establishments. Remember that. On March 23rd through 25th, 1997, 39 members of a UFO apocalyptic occult group called Heaven's Gate, you probably remember this, killed themselves with phenobarbital and vodka in the Rancho Santa Fe suburb of San Diego. As with many apparent cults, when a thread is pulled, it often leads to the shadowy denizens of American spookdom. In the case of Heaven's Gate, one of these connections is via the internet. The web server for the Heaven's Gate website is a small company, Space Star, staffed by one man in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Fracturing Coincidence, another group that uses the services of Space Star, is the Scientific Applications International Corp, or SAIC, or CIAS, spelled backwards. Doubly coincidental is that SAIC is located in La Jolla, California, near Rancho Santa Fe. SAIC is the parent company to a group called Network Solutions, which in turn owns a company called Internic. That group is in charge of all the website addresses on the internet. I want to read that again. I don't know if this is still true. There's probably some other version of this right now, but SAIC is the parent company to a group called Network Solutions, which in turn owns a company called Internic, NIC. That group is in charge of all the website addresses on the internet. So this was back in 19, 1998. So the Heaven's Gate had literally just happened when he wrote this. That's kind of interesting. The board of directors of SAIC includes NSA director Bobby Ray Inman, as well as retired U.S. Army General W.A. Downing. Other alum of SAIC include William Casey, former head of the CIA, until former CIA director John Deutsch, Deutsch, former Defense Secretary Melvin Laird, Donald Kerr, former director of Los Alamos National Laboratory, Donald Kerr, K-E-R-R. -R. Oh, that's a ball jar. I don't know if you guys know this, but the ball jars are made by the same company that make things to uh, utilize within the astronaut. Uh, they're like seals. They make seals, rubber seals for the astronauts, for the space shuttle. And then Kerr, Donald Kerr, who is the former director of Los Alamos National Laboratory, makes the other ball glass jars, right? Kerr jars and ball jars. Just, yeah, okay. And William Perry, the head of the De Department of Defense. So all of those people make up the uh, alum or of this company, SAIC, right? SAIC has been involved in remote viewing experimentation with American intelligence agencies for which medical oversight, according to researcher Jim Schnabel, was provided by Louise jo Louis Jollyan West, Dr. Jolly, the Violence Center, last chapter. San Diego must be a hotbed of strange research at the edges of American spy biz since it is also the location for the Naval Electronics Systems Command, who have been reported to have been another one of the funding sources for Hal Pudoff's early remote viewing experience, experiments at Stanford Research Institute. My sister works down there for the government. Okay. Another interesting connection to Heaven's Gate is alleged researcher John Judge, 
Judge has said that the murdered CIA and British intelligence operative Ian Spiro, who lived within a few blocks of the Heaven's Gate group, was also a member of the group. What would be the purpose of putting together and manipulating a group like Heaven's Gate? It's a good question. Like People's Temple, such a group might provide a model for larger societal manipulation for the fine-tuning of a larger scale New Age religious manipulation. Let me read that again. Like People's Temple, such a group might provide a model for larger societal manipulation for the fine-tuning of larger scale New Age religious manipulation and perhaps a testing ground for drug or electronic manipulation. Intelligence agencies seem to have infiltrated, interfaced, and created some satanic groups with the resurgence of groups of this type beginning in 1966 with the birth of the Church of Satan, founded by Anton LaVey. LaVey studied criminology at the San Francisco City College and worked in the crime lab of the San Francisco Police Department. According to journalist Linda Blood, he maintained a cordial relationship with the SFPD. An associate of LaVey's has also told me that he has personal knowledge that the Satanists also functioned as an informant for Interpol. Prior to the Church of Satan, LaVey ran a group called the Magic Circle, whose members were a surprisingly unsatanic bunch that, according to LaVey biographer Burton Wolf, included an anthropologist who would hold professorship, professorships at Yale, Columbia, and Berkeley, and the chair of the New School for Social Research, a billionaire, an accused pederast. Pederast. Never heard that word before. Pederast? Pederast. A feminist who would go on to direct the National Women's Political Caucus. And a number of San Francisco Police Department employees. What? Oh, just these are all just different people that were part of it. Okay. The most interesting member of the group is said by Wolf to have been the heir to the Vickers Munitions Empire. Although I do not know specifically which member of the Vickers family was involved with LaVey, the family background is telling. Sir Peter Vickers Hall is a Fabian socialist, member of NATO, ding, 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 and alleged to be a senior member of British MI6. His father-in-law, Sir Peter Vickers, worked on the Stanford Re Research Institute Changing Images of Man project, a definitively Tavistock-influenced endeavor. To quote Vickers Hall reeling off his own one-world propaganda, I am perfectly happy working with the Heritage Foundation and groups like that. True Fabians look to the new right to push through some of their more radical ideas. For more than a decade, the British population has been subject to a constant propaganda barrage of how it was on the industrial skids. All of this is true, but the net effect of the propaganda was to demoralize the population. Now remember, in England, they don't have guns. Guns have been banned, right? They don't have any way to defend themselves. Just... This will happen in the United States as the economy worsens. This demoralizing is necessary to make people accept difficult choices. If there is no planning for the future or if constituencies block progress, there will be social chaos on a scale which is currently hard to imagine.
true socialist. The outlook for urban America is bleak. There is a possibility of doing something with the inner cities, but basically the cities will shrink and the manufacturing base will decline, and this will produce social convulsions. Michael Aquino was a prominent member of the Church of Satan, who went on to form his own group, the Temple of Set. Aquino, at the time of his entrance into Levey's group, was an army specialist in intelligence and psychological warfare. In 1973, he became the executive officer of the 306 Psychological Operations Battalion at Fort MacArthur in California. Several other members of the military and military intelligence are alleged to have been involved in the Temple of Set, including a member of the Naval Reserve, a captain in PSYOPs, an intelligence officer, and a reserve army major. Aquino and others were alleged to have been involved in child molestation at the Child Development Center at the Army's Presidio in San Francisco. One in a string of abuse investigations of military daycare centers that have taken place in the past by the Army. Investigations of child abuse have taken place at West Point, Fort Dix, Fort Leavenworth, and Fort Jackson. Other daycare centers investigated for allegations of abuse include a Navy daycare center in Philadelphia, where a man was sentenced to three years in prison for child abuse, two Air Force daycare centers, and a Department of Defense elementary school in Panama. Panama. Reporter Linda Goldston describes what she found when she conducted an on-site investigation at the Presidio. Inside a concrete bunker behind the military intelligence building at the Presidio, the words Prince of Darkness are painted boldly in red on one wall. Used decades ago to house artillery guns, the reinforced concrete batteries appear to have been converted to something like ritual chambers. Emblazoned next to the Prince of Darkness is the word die, and what looks like a list of names painted in red that have been crossed out with heavy black paint. One wall is covered with the num numerals 666, a sign of the devil, and occult drawings. A clearing in the center of the concrete floor, where the ground is exposed, is filled with refuge and partly burned logs. Refuse. On the front wall, Beneath the window that faces the military intelligence building is a huge pentagram inside a circle. In the rear, where sunlight gives way to darkness, white and black candles dripping sit atop, sit drippings sit atop a dome-shaped recession in the wall, appearing a crude, apparently a crude altar. Incense sticks lie half burned to the side. At another battery farther up Lincoln Boulevard, a large drawing of Satan with red eyes and horns appears on an outside concrete wall. Doors to the battery are secured shut. No entry is possible here. So. NATO and San Francisco. <sighs> My father. attended NATO conferences for 40 years, 40 plus years. Every year in Belgium, my mother would always go into a panic every single time 
my father would go away, which was a lot of the time, three weeks out of the month, my dad was gone when I was a child. When he was there, he was vicious and abusive and mean and drunk most of the time. When I ended up living with him in high school, um, I lived with him when I was 15, 16, 17. And then I ended up going back to my mom because he threw me across the room and I hit the front door. He threw me 25 feet in the afternoon while he was drunk. Um, when I lived with him, I, I, there was a couple times where I missed school for several weeks at a time. I was, I was violently ill. Uh, it didn't really make sense to me why I was so sick. Also, um, when he was gone from the house, I was there alone and I would, one day I decided to look through his stuff, right? I don't know why I went in his room or something into the drawers and I found his ring And I found some love letters in an envelope. <clears throat> the love letters were from this woman. Well, actually more than one woman. I think there was two or three in there. Two or three in the two or three letters in there from different women. Several letters, but two or two to th three different women, I think. And they were all love letters from women in Belgium, in, in overseas. Um, he had relationships with many women is what I figured out at that point. And, and because he was separated from my mom, I didn't feel, I was scared of him, first of all. Second of all, I didn't feel like it was my place to tell my mother. Um, so I felt trapped sort of, and I felt like I couldn't really say anything. And I was just livid. I was so angry at him for all the years that he had abused my mother and taken advantage of her and, and then, you know, cheated on her on top of everything. And then I'm, me finding his uh, Masonic ring was just the, t the kicker, you know, the topper. Um, it was like, I didn't know who he was, you know, there was like all these secrets about him and I lived in his house, you know, and shortly thereafter, I found this red roll of red, like what, what would be considered, um, it was like paper, but it was red construction paper, but it was a roll of it. Right. And there was some black spray paint. And so I, I painted my name, C-E-R-A at the time. That was my name. That's how I spelled my name was C-E-R-A. And I painted my name in black on this red paper, black and red, right? This rage came out of me that... I couldn't explain. And I thought that it was in relation to my dad cheating on my mom. But what it actually was, was one, I felt abandoned by him, right? He was barely ever around when I was a kid. My mom was struggling with two daughters. I mean, it was a lot of work. She was really like overwhelmed all the time. 
She did the best she could, but it was a lot for her. He was never supportive of her. And when he was there, he was abusive, right? Like he wasn't a nice guy. He was an alcoholic. Um, and so NATO, right, became this like thorn in my side. And this is after, you know, I've come back from, you know, being, I'm not even going to say it, in some programs and being gone and, and having, you know, practically died in the desert and like, you know, my mom bringing me back to life. And then I go live with, because my mom got possessed and started chasing me around the house with a horse whip. I got scared and I went to live with my other demonic human. I mean, my mom wasn't demonic, but she got possessed at one point and, and it scared the shit out of me. And so I went to be with him, which at the moment in time, it felt like the lesser of two evils, right? But in fact, it wasn't. So my teenage years were really complicated because one, my mother had discovered and, and understood you know, what had happened to me on some level because she had to nurse me back to life at 13 years old. Um, and then, you know, and then, you know, they spied on me and like, I had a secret service agent outside my window for a year of my life. And my dad was always gone. And like, I was afraid to tell him what was going on. So there was all this fear, right? Then my mom was like frightened to her core for me and for the whole situation and couldn't speak about it. Our whole house was bugged, right? So this is so hard for me to talk about. I'm really struggling. I'm so sorry. I'm trying really hard to just stay calm and talk about this because this is a really tough subject for me. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> this is very hard. For me to tell my story like i've kept my mouth shut my whole life so for me to actually be telling anyone publicly what what my life is about is really hard for me and it takes a lot of nerve um okay Whew. okay it's painful still to think about um you know, what went down back then. Uh, I've done a lot of work on it though, and I've healed a lot of it. It's just really hard to talk about. So my parents were in a divorce battle for about two and a half years over me uh, and custody of me because my mother was trying to get me away from my father and I had no respect for either one of them at that point, but I could see with my own eyes that my mother had a good lawyer and that my dad had like some just crazy dark, you know, horrible lawyer, right? Who was bulldozing my mother and bullying her. I could just see it all, you know? And my mother was fighting to keep me and to keep me safe. And I see that now. Um, And my father won on some level, and I ended up going to live with him. I mean, he didn't totally win, but what ended up happening is my mom, you know, had that little outbreak, and I got scared, and so I went to my dad's, and I started living with my dad. So my high school years were really like up and down, 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 and you know, I'm a teenager on top of all of this, right? It was just, it was hell on earth. It was just crazy what I was going through. And one of the memories that came up for me was being in the Masonic temple across the street from my church. And one day I was, you know, we were at church and I walked outside and it was after the service and we were all standing there and I looked across the street and I had flashes of the inside of the Masonic temple. And my dad was standing there with me. 
And I said, oh, wow, that's like, I can see inside. I know exactly what the, where the hallways are. Like I could literally see everything as if I'd been in there and knew all the hallways and underground tunnels of this place, right? And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. That's, you know, for private only. You have to be invited to the temple. And, da, 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 and I said, well, dad, you would know about that, wouldn't you? And he just looked at me like, he had no response. Like he didn't know what to say to me in that moment because I said it in front of all of these people, right? And he just didn't say anything. He just, he didn't know what to say. But later on, he was abusive and he abused me. He never said anything about that statement but I had publicly humili I had stood up to him in public, right? And, and he publicly humiliated him in front of all these people, which he used to do to me all the time. And I was just sick of it, especially after I had found the freaking ring, right? I was just done. And I was 15, so I was in full rebellion at that point, right? <laughs> so later on, we went home and I lived with him. Right. And he decided to be abusive and, and hit me and grab me and, and just be, and be, he was drunk and just like a complete asshole. Right. And I like ran down the street, hyperventilating to the neighbor's house and like, you know, trying to fucking get my composure and keep myself together. Um, it was a mess, dude. <laughs> it was a total mess. So that's one memory of my life. And, and shortly thereafter, actually, I was at my friend's house and I was on the top of the roof. I remember this very clearly. Um, I was, I was on a cordless phone and I was talking to my dad. I was threatening my dad that I was going to jump off the roof. Like I was, I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump, I'm going to kill myself. And he goes, go ahead. What that did for me, though, is that one statement kept me alive because I knew that he meant it, and that was enough anger inside of me, enough rage to prove him wrong in that moment that I was going to live because he told me to go jump off the fucking roof, right? So I literally stayed alive because of that, to prove him wrong, that I was worthy, right, is what kept me alive through all of that. And at that point, you have to remember, I was like a 37, 38-year-old woman in a 15-year-old body, right? So I was already an adult. Like in my consciousness, I was already a grown woman, but I was in a, a young teenage body attempting to like function in a high school environment. It was crazy, dude. Like I was, I was so far beyond my years, like holy shit, far beyond my years, right? It's funny because I still have somebody in my life who uh, was my neighbor from across the street growing up. And he tells me stories of his memories of me from that time period. And he was two years older than me, but he remembers me distinctly during that time because it was such a potent time in my life that I don't know who else was paying attention, but obviously he was. And he was witnessing and observing all the crazy, right? And it's like I made such an impression on him that he, it, it's to this day. You know, and it's like 35 years later, whatever, you know, 36 years later. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. So there's that. And then there's one other memory that correlates with Presidio. Um, but the memories I have from Presidio don't actually, I, I don't have full memory of that at that at this point, but I do know that I was there. Um, 
I know I was there at least three times, if not more. I know that I was utilized in some way. Um, and that, you know, I was also uh, kidnapped in Golden Gate Park uh, at the age of four years old. Um, I was also brought to San Francisco when I was 15 for a violin camp, right? Because I was a prodigy violinist. Um, and that I, again, had an experience at 15 where they utilized me for some ritual. Uh, but I don't have memory of that either. So part of what they do is they have what's called EDOM, which is Electronic Dissolution of Memory. They have a way to mind swipe the activity or the event that took place so that you have absolutely no recollection of it. And they replace it with another memory. They put a screen memory on top of it. Or they put a screen memory in place of it, I should say. Because what happens is they either dissolve the memory completely out through, it's a, it's a form of electrocution, but it's not electrocution, but it's a form of something with the synapses in the brain and the neurons. Like they have some way of retracting it to the back of your unconscious mind, right? And, but with the satanic rituals specifically, those, I feel they do not want you to remember no matter what. It's very, very difficult to get access to those levels of memory. And for some people, in other situations that aren't military in satanic ritual, it's much easier for them to recall their memory. Even though they still have a mind swipe, it's different. Um, but through military applications, they have devices that do this electronic dissolution of memory, but they also have uh, trauma-based mind control techniques that are specifically administered to people like me, for example, who had several layers of personalities implemented within my consciousness that could be activated at any moment in time. I have since dismantled those personalities. There were many, and I have managed to, to, to release all of them. I don't, I don't ever get triggered anymore like that. I always know when someone's trying to trigger me, if at all, and it just doesn't work on me anymore, thank God. But this was a, a huge problem in my 20s because somebody could come along and literally activate me, and I would lose time and be gone from my life and come back and not know where I had been, not have any recollection of what had happened to me. Um, so it's, it's a big problem. And uh, people go out, out of consciousness and they like wake up and they're somewhere else or they, you know, it's, it's a major problem for targeted individuals, right? So these are the types of things that they don't want you to know are going on behind the scenes. Right. Uh, and most people like me never make it this far. Most people like me don't live past 30 years old. If they're lucky. Most individuals that have gone through some kind of secret military program are dead. Um, that's just the facts. So those of us that have survived, and there are many, but those of us that have survived um, this level of stuff are few. But the, there's a lot that have survived that haven't had the, the, the severity, right? Some have had more severity than others. It depends on what they were involved in, obviously. Um, like, for example, the Secret Space Program is just one program right? And then there's the hybrid breeding programs. And then there's the, you know, the MK Ultra programs. And, and so one person could go through all of those things, right? And then it's like, um, there's all the other people who like went through some kind of indoctrination and mind control through their family, through their bloodline, 
right? And they have no recollection of it whatsoever. And they just are in that mode. And they have no idea that they're in that mode until such time as they realize and they wake up and they begin to understand that they have been under mind control and then they start to dismantle it, okay? But you have to remember that not everybody will get there. Not everybody will be able to dismantle the mind control. So what we're seeing right now on a collective level is that we are seeing the indoctrination and the dumbing down and the and the the cultural i want to say culturalization of mk ultra in our society human experimentation engineering human consciousness that is literally what we are seeing on a global mass scale right now it is so clear you can see it. You can see it. And so being clear is the first priority. Being sourced from source energy in your vertical alignment, in your own God source energy is number one priority right now. Your own resonance field, your own intuitive knowing about what's going on not the fear you got to look past the fear you got to like say thank you for sharing bye bye fear let me look at what's really going on here let me be objective in my observation of reality right now because the mainstream media narrative is going to do everything in its power to dismantle your critical thinking skills and to sway you in the direction of one way or another. And you can tell by the way they administer the information, the way they imprint you with the thoughts. They use fear and they use ego and they use glamorization. Those three things is how they get to you. They go glamorize you that this thing's gonna happen and it's amazing, right? Or they project onto someone else that they're the problem. They blame, right? Or they accuse somebody of being narcissistic and then act like they're amazing, but there's no substance under what they're saying. There's no, there's no actual critical thinking skills, objective perception of anything going on. There's no like facts. There's no, you know, like real information. And scientism, they're like, this is what it is. This is the authority. No, they are not the authority. You are the authority. Your own knowingness about what's going on is the authority. Your independent sovereignty, that is the authority. Period. What is best for you should be celebrated and honored if it's not harming someone else. That's the only caveat really is that you can't do harm to another living being and be in right relations with source. You know, and that, that whole thing, that loophole, those loopholes that got created with that in the universal law of free will, you know, everybody has free will, right? So the universe is like, here, this is your free will universe. And so they just took and ran with it, right? But at the expense of someone else, they were not in right relations with universal laws and principles. So when you come, when you come into right relations with yourself and with source, I'm going to say source as opposed to God because I don't know how anybody feels about God and it doesn't matter. Source, right? The infinite love of the universe and your right relations and harmonics within that. Doing no harm. Service to others, right? Harmony and peace. 
and love and grace, right? Those are the most important things for me that keep me going every single day. I'm just one person. You know what I mean? And like, I'm one person that's been through a lot. And I've learned what works and what doesn't for me. And it may not work for someone else, what works for me in relation to them. And if I've harmed someone unintentionally, they're going to tell me, I'm going to figure it out. They're going to, they're going to let it be known. And I'm going to do my part and come into right relations with them in any way that I am capable of, right? That's how I choose to operate. I choose to bring things back into the space of love and right relations with other people. And my God, I'm a human being and shit happens all the time. And I'm like, oh my God, I need to like check myself. You know, we all need to check ourselves, especially right now. I'm not going to point the finger at anyone else. I am not going to say, you need to wear a mask or you don't need to wear a mask. I'm not going to do that either. Every single person right now needs to make a sovereign choice for themselves. They need to make a decision about what's going to work for them in this moment in time. And put their energy behind what feels the most important to them in terms of the global dynamic shift that we are in right now and how we want to contribute our energy, our time, our money, our generosity. Because we are in this together and we need to stay together and work together as humanity, as human beings. And acting according to universal law, of course, and not harming others. Because we have a group of people right now whose intentions are to harm the entire population of the planet. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. It's not going to happen. Just saying. <sighs> All right. I've expressed enough, I think, for this moment in time. <laughs> Loving you, blessing you, hope you're doing well. Peace to you on this planet, wherever you are. I'm sending you love and grace and patience and peace. Hope you're having a beautiful day and beautiful evening, wherever you are. Until next time, peace out.